everybody, my name is Scott Waters. Welcome to No Life Till Metal. I'm going to be doing Artist Spotlight today on one of my favorite bands from the 1990s. This is Tourniquet. Um, in my past spotlights, Artist Spotlights, I've done mostly 70s and 80s bands. So this is going to be a band whose first album came out in 1990. And that album would be Stop the Bleeding by Tourniquet. Intense Records. Walked into a Christian bookstore um, in 1990 looking for some new music and uh, talked to the clerk who happened to be Robert Gutierrez of Ultimatum. Um, at the time, Robert was not, of course, there was no Ultimatum. Ultimatum formed in 1992. Um, and he threw this album at me. And uh, I checked out the cassette demo of it and loved it and bought immediately this album and have loved it ever since. Um, just straightforward heavy metal, um, kind of progressive, little, well, actually quite a bit of Mercy Fate influence in both the vocal and the music. Um, very, very good. Um, this band was actually formed in 1989 by three members. It would have been Ted Kirkpatrick on drums, who, who writes a lion's share of the band's music and, and, and uh, lyrics. Um, and he's actually the one member of the band who's remained constant throughout the decades the band has been together. Uh, and then Gary Lanier on guitar and Guy Ritter on vocals. And uh, this album was later reissued. This is the reissue. The reissue is very cool. It's worth playing in the background. Um, it sounds fantastic, um, and also I love the booklets in these reissues because it shows lots of photos from that time period. Uh, as well, it was reissued on vinyl. This is the red vinyl version of Turning to Stop the Bleeding, and I believe this is like a 2011 and 12, 2011 prosthetic records. This was released in a couple different colors. It was like a splatter vinyl, and then the red vinyl, which is the one I have. Uh, then in 1991, they released one of my all-time favorite albums, and they added a couple members to the band. They, Victor Macias on, on bass, and uh, I can't remember the other guitar player's name that they added. Let's see if I can on here. Eric Mendez on guitar. And this is Cycle Surgery, and this is a fantastic album. Uh, probably, I don't know, I have a hard time picking between this one and Stop the Bleeding is my two favorite tourniquet albums. To this day, the tur two albums I love the most from them. Eventually this one was re-released too, and uh, apparently the band had always wanted the album to be called Psycho Surgery, just one name. So when the band released it on their own, um, a slightly modified cover, and it is now one word, Psycho Surgery. As well, it was released on vinyl. This is, I believe, blue, blue vinyl, and again, Psycho Surgery, one word, one word instead of two. And that, by most fans, is the classic tourniquet lineup. Um, unfortunately, this lineup really only lasted for this album and the follow-up from 1992, um, Pathogenic Ocular Dissonance. And by this point, the band had gotten very, very progressive, um, very technical, um, faster, thrashier. Um, some of the more melodic parts uh, were gone. Uh, even the vocals were harsher. Not, not death metal or thrashy, just harsher, uh, more gravelly, less of this high-pitched stuff, falsetto stuff you hear here. Um, but still a great album. This is actually the Metal Blade version of the album. I originally bought the Intense version, and later picked up the uh, Metal Blade version because it had the um, addition of the Tempter, a trouble cover on this album, and that's, I just love that cover. So I had to have that version of it. And it's basically the same as the... It's basically the same as the Intense version with the exception of the added bonus track. Um, so I... That was also later re-released with a completely different cover. Frankly, I like the original cover a little better. Uh, though I do like the booklet, it's got tons of photos. And also, all these reissues on CD had bonus tracks, most of them on live stuff, a few of it being like demo stuff, um, and like the intros that they used from the concert to ride it to here. Uh, and it was also released on, just recently released, like just weeks ago, I just recently showed it. Um, this is one, one of 100, limited number of pressings of this version of it. This one actually is number 56 of 100. You can see the number right there. Uh, it's on a uh, very cool double, it's a double album, and each of the vinyls is very different. The center ring of the vinyl, which if you pre-ordered it, you got a little autograph center ring, but this center ring is actually shattered and blown out into the vinyl. Very cool looking. If you go back and look at my last vinyl update video, which I'll put a link to above, um, you can actually see I show off the vinyl for this one. And it is a gatefold, and I guess I can show the gatefold real quick. And again, this is my, another one of my favorites from them. Um, as much as I say it's progressive, oh, yeah, that was my name on it. 
<laughs> this little sticker is actually on there when it came, but I left it on there. Um, and technical, it still had memorable songs. Skizix Dilemma. Uh, oh, and I also should mention that this vinyl version has a bonus track, the Skizix Dilemma Part 2 is on here as well. And that was the end of that lineup. Um, after that, guy, excuse me, it's your nose. Guy really left the band. Um, the band recorded a, um, a, a part of an, a series. This is actually volume two in the series, Deliverance is volume one, um, a live in studio release uh, of some of their own material. So they recorded a uh, Phantom Limb, Arc of, they did a kind of a blend of Arc of Suffering and Stereo Track. Stereo Track. One more time Stereo Taxic Atrocities. Um, Hector Patrick has always been an avid um, animal rights activist, and uh, that, those two songs are both about the atrocities that uh, animals suffer. Um, so they recorded a medley of those. Whitewash tune, Skeezus Dilemma, and they recorded two covers on here. The Tempter, um, which is a trouble cover, which is the one that ended up on the Metal Blade release that I showed recently. And The Messiah, which is a Blood Good cover, with uh, Les Carlson filling in on vocals for that song and several others. Uh, Les Carlson of Blood Good was filling in because um, Guy Ritter had left the band at this point. So the band did get a new vocalist. They got um, Luke Easter on vocals, and they put out Vanishing Lessons. And again, the style changed drastically on this one. Much more groove-based, still very heavy. Um, Acid Head, just a fantastic song. Um, still heavy metal, still, you know, not... I don't want to say, I don't want to make it sound like they, you know, went for like a funk sound or when I say groove, um, or even like a Pantera sound. Tentacid really are their own unique beast. <laughs> Nobody quite sounds like them. And even when they went for this sound, uh, I, like I said, I prefer the first three albums, but I think this album is great. And when it first came out, I played it over and over and over again. And I still listen to this one quite a bit, and, you know, um, even today. Um, here's the reissue. Um, Similar cover art, this cover was done by Rexorcist. And again, it features some live uh, bonus tracks and photos of the band from that time period. And this album was released, I'm trying to remember when this one was released, in 1990. And it's gotta be on here somewhere. 1994. Vanishing Lessons. And I'm hoping that this one will eventually be released on vinyl. As of now, it's never been released on vinyl. Um, but considering that they released the first three on vinyl, uh, the band did independently, I'm hoping that maybe that one will be released as well. They followed that up with an EP, Carry the Wounded. Again, very different. Some leftover tracks that sound like they could have been on Vanishing Lessons, uh, but also a, uh, a ballad on here and a cover of Oh Well, which um, I believe was a Fleetwood Mac. 1995, I believe this is. It might have been 94. Um, this is a five song EP. One, two, three, four, five song EP. Yeah, there's a love song on here, a uh, total ballad love song, but it's still very good, not cheesy, you know, I'm trying to never released cheese, in my opinion. Uh, everything they've released, I've loved, so. Uh, followed that up with a kind of a best of release. This is uh, the hand, the uh, the collected works of Tourniquet, and um, it featured songs from the first four albums, as well as two new songs, Perfect Night for Hanging, super heavy, great song. Actually, the, the new songs I here were just fantastic. It gave me hope that they were going to get some release an album that was just, you know, as good as those first three. As much as I love that heaviness and the, and the technical aspect and the progressiveness, those, these two songs, uh, The Hand Trembler and Perfect Night for Hanging, gave me hope that the next album was going to give that. But what we got instead was this one. This is um, Crawl of China. And again, another rapid departure from the inner sound and this one's kind of all over the place you've got like alternative rock on here alternative metal on here um, a little a little funk uh, uh, groove it's just, it's just all over the place uh, and I like this album but to be honest it's probably one of my least favorite from Tourniquet um, this album is actually a pre-release that uh, I got from a Texas rock fest when Ultimatum was um, playing with them and as you can see it's autographed by Luke and Ted and uh, it was a picture. The uh, it was a picture, a picture of the cover on here. That's the cover was just white with that uh, picture in here and the updated '90s looking tourniquet logo. Uh, I don't know. It's not a bad album by any stretch of the imagination. Um, like I said, I don't think tourniquet at least a bad album. Um, just different, you know. Uh, a song like Bats, you know, put that up against 
what you're hearing here, where you're getting kind of a mix of thrash and doom and just dark heavy metal. This is much more upbeat. <laughs> it's hard to sometimes put music into words, especially uh, it's, music is a sound, you know, and it's just it's hard to put into words. Uh, see, that was followed up by, um, let's see, what was next? I think it was this one. It's the, uh, up the uh, Acoustic Archives, and this one was released, a numbered release. Uh, my copy is uh, 764. All of them were autographed by one of the members of the band. You can see in the spine there. Mine was released, was, uh, arg was argued. Mine was signed by guitarist Aaron Gera. Gera? I think that's how you say him, Gera. Um, and it is all acoustic versions of old tourniquet songs, and I, I gotta confess, you know, I'm not a big fan of acoustic albums, but this one is spectacular. Um, I listen to it over and over and over again. And then on the very end of the album, there was one new song called uh, Trivializing the Lamentous, Complicating the Obvious. Another heavy, heavy, technical, dark song that, again, gave me hope that the next album was going to be that, you know, return to the, the heavier, thrashier, complex sound that they gave us on those first three albums. And what they gave us was exactly that. Uh, Metal Blade Records were Moth and Rust Destroy, um, heavy, aggressive, technical, progressive, um, sometimes thrashy, sometimes mid-paced, um, sometimes straight-up doom metal, because, um, uh, of course, Ted Kirkpatrick, drummer Ted Kirkpatrick, actually played for a short spell in uh, Trouble, and is a big fan of, fan of um, uh, doom metal. So, uh, and I believe uh, Marty Friedman was one of the guest guitar players in this album, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I should, probably could have looked that up before I started doing this video, but you know how it is on the Left to Metal channel, I just wing it. <laughs> I remember what I remember, and if I screw up, you guys let me know in the in the bottom. Uh, special guest musicians, Marty Friedman and Bruce Franklin of Trouble. And the guest musicians would become pretty much just, um, something the band would do over and over again. Um, Steve Rowe from Mortification was a guest vocalist on one of the albums, and like I said, they just, uh, they've had from this point on, they just had guest musicians on all their albums. That was followed up by another Metal Blade release. This is a microscopic view of a telescopic realm. Again, Luke Easter still on vocals, Aaron on guitar. And this album is, again, very progressive, very heavy, very dark. Um, it's, this is now turning it's just found the sound that is all their own. Um, and they weren't jumping around as much as they were after their third album. It seemed to me like an album like Call of China, they were trying to please everybody. And, um, I don't know, maybe they weren't. Who knows, you know, I can't, I wasn't in the band, so I couldn't tell you. But with this album, it just seems like they were doing what they, what they wanted to do. They didn't care what other people, um, you know, were wanting them to do. And uh, very classically influenced as well. Um, not that there's any classical music on here, but you can just hear it in the in the songwriting. Uh, Ted Kirkpatrick, you know, writes almost all of it, if not all of it, um, vocals and uh, vocals, lyrics and music. And you can really hear his. Um, he's a huge fan of classical music, and you can really hear it in this music. And a recent release from just a few years ago. This is um, Antiseptic Bloodbath, self-released, I believe. I think the band did a, um, a Kickstarter for this one, if I'm not mistaken. I think it might have been in on that. I can't remember now. <laughs> um, but uh, this album, again, is pretty dark. Um, not quite as memorable as, as, as some of the other ones, in my opinion. Um, it seemed to me like they were just trying to become more so technical that they almost like... So, they don't sound like Dream Theater at all, but Dream Theater has some albums that are just so proggy, so technical, that you just tend to get lost in it, you know, you don't really remember it. And that's kind of how I felt about Endoseptic Bloodbath. Not that it's a bad album whatsoever. Uh, again, you get tons of musicians, that, uh, guest musicians on here. Uh, let's see if it says on here, because I don't remember off the top of my head who was in it. And I don't see it off the top of my head here. But I was thinking that the Marty Friedman was, was, might have been on here again. I can't remember, doesn't make a difference. Uh, Anesthetic Bloodbath, a very dark, dark cover with uh, Jesus on the cross and then a, a rotting cow underneath of it. Again, obviously having something to do with Ted Kirkpatrick's love of animals and, and, and his, uh, his views on um, animal rights. And the most recent album was supposed to be, it was originally supposed to be a Ted Kirkpatrick solo album. Instead, it became Ted Kirkpatrick's Tourniquet 
Onward of Freedom. This one was released with two different covers. Um, I only have the one cover. Love to get the other one one of these days. It was only released on CD as far as I know. Um, and this one here is all guest musicians, um, including vocalist Luke Easter, who sings on, I think, one song. Um, and this is all about animal rights. The entire album is about animal rights and, and animal issues and those kind of things. Um, but the guests on here, you've got Michael Sweet from Striper, you've got uh, see Kevin Young of Disciple, Luke Easter, Tony Palacios of, of uh, Guardian, um, Bruce Franklin of, of uh, Trouble, uh, Rex Carroll of White Cross, Chris Poland, X Megadeth, Doug Pinnock of King's X, Marty Friedman. Um, that's just some of the guest artists that were on here. I'm, to, I'm pretty sure that um, Frank Burrito played one of these, he was a guest on one of these two albums. Um, I just don't see his name listed on this one, but I would have swore he was one of the guests that, that played on here. Guess not. <laughs> Regardless, um, last album that they put out, there's also several side projects. Um, Ted's released some solo material, some, some, some poetry on CD he's released under the Ted Kirkpatrick name. Um, Edgar Allan Poe stuff, he's really into Edgar Allan Poe. Um, there's been some other side projects from the band from various other members. But as far as Tourniquet goes, this is the last thing they've released. This is back in 2014, I believe. Yes, 2014. And again, this is a self-released album on Tourniquet's own record label. That's it! That is the entire Tourniquet discography. Um, only the first three were available on, on vinyl, which is why I only showed those ones. Um, hopefully, they'll release more of their stuff on vinyl. In the meantime, if you haven't heard of Tourniquet, check them out. They've been playing in the background the entire time. Well worth looking into if you like technical, progressive, um, heavy metal that mixes so many different styles together. Um, that's it. Hope you enjoyed this uh, artist spotlight. Uh, and that's, uh, I guess, all I'm going to say. Thumbs up, thumbs down. That's it, you know. You liked it, you didn't like it, whatever. Leave a message below. Love talking music with you. Um, maybe you know more about them than I do and want to tell me something I forgot or something I should have said. Or maybe I made a mistake. <laughs> Not uncommon of me. Um, so, anyhow, that's it. God bless. Stay strong.